Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful morning it is. Very nice. And you all can say we're all in our place with bright, shiny faces. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, we got a great row right here of three missionaries all come the same time to show us how much they love us. We are so glad you're all here. So, Jim, if you do the honors of leading us in prayer to start a service, yes, and lead us. Let's give thanks. Well, Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful for the privilege to come into your house this day and to, to hear from your servant, Lord, uh, Eric, who is out serving you, Lord God. And we're just grateful again for how you're using each of our lives. Lord God, we continue to pray for your ongoing help and blessing to be upon us. And thank you for giving us the good strength and the health this day that we can be here. We don't take this for granted, Lord. And we just want to just praise you and honor you as you are so deserving of such worship and praise. Because again, Lord, you have changed our lives, Lord, and you have transformed us. And Lord, we want to be able to better serve you and honor you through our lives. And we're asking that you'll continue to help us, Lord God, in all of our ways. Lord God, be with us, be with us here through this time of worship. And Lord, speak to our hearts and help us to see beyond even our situation here in Rock Glen, but to be able to be mindful of what's going on around the world so that we can keep our dear brethren in prayer. And Lord God, just continue to help us here as well as we desire to see you glorified through our church and through our lives. And we pray for Pastor Duff and Claudette as well. We pray that you'll continue to guide and bless them too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Go ahead and open your hymnal to number 438. Number 438. We're going to sing the first verse, the third, and the fourth. Okay? So one, three, and four. So when you find your place, join me in singing.
but I continue with the ministry, and next month I will be celebrating 20 years with Sunset Solutions. So, so there's a verse in Matthew 24, and I shared it during Sunday school, that's always intrigued me. And Jesus is talking to his disciples when he says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end shall come. And then in Revelation 7, John is talking about what he sees in heaven. And he says, I, I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, stand before the throne and before the Lamb. And he goes on to share how they are worshiping him. So when we think about these verses, when we think about these days in which we live, how is it possible that these scriptures will be fulfilled when you may not realize over a third of the world's population has yet to even hear the name of Jesus? There are so many nations closed to the gospel. So how will... Um, how will the Lord ever come if this gospel of the kingdom must first be preached in every nation to all peoples? How will people from every nation, tribe, and tongue stand before the throne when so many have yet to hear? I want you to be encouraged this morning because we are seeing God's kingdom accelerated and advanced in some of the hardest to reach places on earth. And this is happening in part because of technology. So whether it's the Yao in Southeast Asia, which are the most resistant unreached people group, 99% Muslim, whether it's them and the, the radio station that we were able to put in, Radio Lilan Luka, which means radio light, and they are now hearing the broadcasts in their heart language, Chiao, and uh, the station has become very popular and people are getting saved. Or whether it is the refugee camps in Uganda, uh, in Kenya, in Rwanda, in Zambia. We are seeing uh, those refugees with sunset radios now, and they're hearing the gospel message, and now their suffering is making sense in light of the scriptures, and peace is coming to those camps, and peace is coming to their hearts. Whether it's our solar ministry toolkit in places like Ukraine, where People are so devastated, and those who are left behind feel forgotten, and they're experiencing the shelling and the bombing and, and all that is going on there. And yet, the churches are stepping up, and they're able to meet the needs of the people, uh, providing light and cell phone charging stations. Communication is so important, and other um, other things, and bomb shelters, etc. And the church is growing in Ukraine because of that. Um, praise the Lord. God is at work. He is doing great. Um, whether it's um, an aviation ministry that can only reach in, this, in the Asia Pacific region, can only um, reach some isolated people that can only be reached by air, and our team coming alongside them and helping them with their power issues so that they can go about the business God has called them to. Or whether it's our Sunset Link technology that is able to monitor the health and wellness of water systems around the world and keep the clean water flowing and giving ministries on the ground the ability to build relationships, to build trust, and to share the living water, Jesus Christ. God is at work. We come alongside, Sunset Solutions comes alongside mission organizations and ministries um, around the world uh, to help reach people in the hardest to reach places on earth. And so God is at work. Um, so despite what you see in the news, despite Everything you hear, despite the discouragement around you, know that God is going to accomplish his purposes. And someday, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be standing before the throne of God. Praise his name. Amen. I just want to highlight very quickly, it's going to be very quick, to share some of the things that I have on the um, table in the back, um, some brochures. And I do have prayer card, feel free to pick up a prayer card or my newsletter, and if you would like to um, be on my mailing list, there's contact information that you can get in touch with me. 
There's also Sunset Solutions quarterly newsletter, and there's a card in there if you want to subscribe to that. And I talk more in depth about each of our technologies during Sunday School, but if you would like more details about those technologies, there's um, brochures about each one of them and the impact they're having around the world. And probably the, the best overview of the ministry would be our annual report, and this um, helps you see the impact around the world. It just gives an overview of the ministry as a whole. And if you um, would like to donate toward, we, I talked about Sunset Radios during Sunday School, if you would like to donate toward Sunset Radios, but would like to do that in honor of a loved one, or in memory of a loved one, or in honor of a loved one, there's these little envelopes here where you can do that. And finally, these are not on the table, but if you want more information, see me and I can give you one of these. But um, if you feel the Lord calling you into missions, in joining our ministry, there's information about the positions that are available. And we love college interns. If you know of any college interns that would like to serve at Sunset Solutions using their giftings toward kingdom work, um, I have information on that. And finally, we do have a one-year Discover program as well. So you can uh, let me know if you need any other information. Thank you. did a wonderful presentation at 9 o'clock, and so we gained a lot from that, and so what a blessing it was. And the best part is that her and Paul were part of this church before I was here. So good, good folks. Okay, let me, um, if you got your prayer list, turn it over, and we got our bulletin on the back, and I will go through those announcements. First of all, Suzanne, I'm so glad you came today. She's got a birthday this week. So, happy birthday to you. And then, of course, Erica's here today. And I would really strongly encourage you to pick up the brochures that she has there because it just helps you to understand more fully what the ministry is about, what she's about, and it's always helpful, and I think the greatest compliment we received as a congregation was from your nephew, Steve and Sarah, that are neighbor. And this is the story I'll tell, and you correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Anyways, they had showed up, and of course, they've been now serving in England for, oh, probably about 12 years, a little bit longer, maybe about 15. Anyways, they came out of Michigan, and they were part of a church in Michigan where they were on staff. And so the one time they came here, you folks from their newsletters had just millions of questions. And they said, you know, we don't get asked that many questions in Michigan from our own church. And it was just something that was greatly encouraging. And so these missionaries... <clears throat> by the newsletters and everything that we receive from them, this is our opportunity to stay updated so that when they come and see us, we know something about what they're doing. And that means a lot. It means a lot to everyone. Okay. Um, the Israel story, we started that last Sunday night, and so it's going to be continuing. Uh, I do have leftovers from last Sunday night, two copies of each. We had four sessions. There's three sessions here. You're welcome to come and pick one up or pick multiple ones up. And then uh, tonight we'll continue in our study. And then last week in our Power for Living paper, they were promoting this app, gotquestions.org. And so I actually went on and started looking at it. And I would wholeheartedly recommend it. Something you can access with your phone. And uh, it's all kind of questions being answered pertaining to any issues that you can figure out connected to the Bible. They have a top 20 of the most questions they've received as far as repeats. And I just picked out a couple of the top 20. And what they do is they produce articles based straight on scripture 
and give a little bit of commentary concerning whatever it is, whatever the issue is. So you can look up anything and in minutes have information right directly from the Bible. So gotquestions.org, I would highly recommend, use it on your phone, and anytime you got a question that you think can be traced back to the Bible, punch it in, and you'll probably get a good, solid, biblical answer. Okay, the luncheon. I see they're up, right? So in two weeks is our normal luncheon after the service. And Denise has put all the stuff up there. Is there anything you want to say? It's potluck this time, so whatever the ladies bring in is what's potluck this time. Would you like to come up here and say <laughs> I can't get anybody to come up to the platform and make announcements. <laughs> okay, so it's going to be potluck. Does everybody know what that means? Okay, potluck means bring whatever. So that's, man, a smorgasbord. Right. Everybody know what that means? So look forward to that. So be sure and sign up. Sign up to bring something. Okay, then I have a thank you from uh, one of our missionary couples. This is from Dondra Decker, the wife of Paul Decker. He's the campus minister at UV that we support. And it says, Dear members of Rock Glen Baptist, thank you so much for the lovely signed birthday card. Paul and I really appreciate your thoughtfulness, prayers, and support. We are grateful for all of you. May God bless you as you serve him. In Christ, Paul and Dondra Decker. Did you get a card from us? A birthday card? Okay. So we're getting these cards out, and they mean a lot, just as we just got word. So thank you for doing your part and signing the cards in the back every month, because it does mean a lot. Okay, a couple prayer requests I want to mention to you. If you flip over and look at your prayer list, okay, on that side, first of all, I would want to draw your attention to number 10 there, Debbie Hall. Um, she's been having a lot of medical issues and a lot going on with her back. And she just called me yesterday and we talked. And she's going to have a shot this week that will hopefully help with some of the medical issues. So we need to be praying for Debbie. Okay, and then second, if you look at, oh, where is it? Number four, Wandy Hackett. She, I have, this is an update from what I have listed there, is she is now in decline, physical decline. And so I got a call from the family, and I went over yesterday about noon and spent some time with her, and we just reminisced about what's coming in heaven. And we just had a ball thinking about it because we were talking about all the people from the congregation that we can remember that have already been promoted. And uh, what it's gonna be like for her to see them. And it just brought a big smile over our faces thinking about that. So again, she's preparing to cross the finish line and then everything will be made new. And I told her, just kidding, I said, you know, so you're going to get there before I do. And I said, I have no doubt when I get there that you're going to have your track shoes on. And you're going to tell me, quick, quick, come over here. Look at this. And I'll be running right behind you. And then you go, quick, quick, let's go over there. Because if you know her in her better days, that was her, right? Quick, quick, let's go. So that's going to return. So in heaven... If she gets there before you do, prepare to have your track shoes on because she's going to run you all over the place. So pray for her as she prepares for what's coming. Glory is just ahead. But pray for her in this time that she has left here on earth, that the Lord will be very gracious and kind. So I think that's all the announcements, everything I can tell you. So let's pray for these requests. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your kindness, your blessing. We're thankful also, Lord, for Suzanne, being able to celebrate with her another birthday, and we pray your blessing on her this week. We also are glad that Erica was able to come and make a safe journey from Indiana to be with us. It's, it's a joy to see her again. We pray your blessing on her as she 
spends the month traveling to visit with supporters and share updates about the ministry as she has done here. And we would ask that you would be with her and sustain her through that traveling for this month. And then we do think of the, re the requests, Lord. We think of Debbie Hall, and she's been going through a lot of physical infirmity. We would pray for this um, medical shot this week that it might benefit her in a great way. We ask that you'll continue to sustain her. And then we also think about Wandi. We are so thankful for the time that she's been here amongst us. I know she told me yesterday it's been 12 years, 12 years that she's been here a part of the congregation. And so we would ask that you would sustain her and strengthen her for what's ahead. We know that the finish line is getting close and glory is just ahead. And so we pray that you sustain her through the time she has left. We pray for her family especially as they prepare for what, what's coming. Thank you for what you're going to accomplish in her life. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our greeting hymn. We're going to go to number 448, greeting him. We're only going to sing the first verse only, 448. And those of you that might not know what we're talking about when we say greeting him, what we do is we sing through. When we're done, then we just move all over the place and we greet one another, okay? And nobody stays in their pew except a very small number. Everybody else is move it frontwards backwards and sideways okay so just so you know what's coming all right so if you found your place join me in standing we'll just be singing the first verse then we'll three for another
Okay, and then I'm gonna do it anyways. I'm gonna talk about you for just a second. I have the privilege of having here as guests uh, Doug Domes and his wife, Rosie. And you might say, what's the connection? Well, about 20 years ago, right around there, he came with Ferris Hyman, a couple other singers, the quartet, and sang for us. Yep. Uh, okay, and I heard somebody, Charlie, remember? Yep. Yeah, so he came and sang, and they did a wonderful job. And so he's good, they're good friends of Erica. And so they came to encourage her. And so we are just so glad that you're here with us. Uh, what a wonderful memory that is. Um, the other thing I forgot to say, but in the back is a plate in the back for anything you might want to give for Erica that we were going to give to her to compensate her for all the work she's going to do for this month in this area. Okay, so encourage you to give to help her because it's expensive. It's expensive to be out of your home doing this. Okay, well, go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And a question to kind of lead us off is what does it look like when a soul is turned away from death to life? And the answer to that question, I think, is addressed really beautifully. In Luke chapter 19. So we're going to begin reading verses 1 through 5. Okay, verses 1 through 5. Luke 19, verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see... Who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So according to Luke, Jesus is passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. He's not seeing anything in these villagers to cause him to stop and stay like he did at the village of the Samaritan woman. But as he's leaving, he spots Zacchaeus, the short, rich, and wicked man, straining to get a glimpse of him instead of ignoring his journey through town. And this prompts Jesus to call him by name and tell him of his desire to come to this man's house. Now look at verse 6. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. What was Zacchaeus thinking as he came down from that tree? He couldn't believe that someone like Jesus would ever visit him. And those in the village couldn't believe it either. You might say, why? Well, look at verse 7. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Now, did Jesus make the proper choice? In going to this man's house, in spite of the criticism hurled at him for doing so. Well, let's continue to look at verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. This is amazing. After listening to Jesus in his home for a definite period of time, this man showed a drastic change in his soul, which was unexpected by the villagers. And how was the change in his life expressed? Well, Zacchaeus worked for the Romans against his own people in taxing them and even taking from them what the Romans didn't require. 
Would he have been sympathetic to the poor among his own people? The answer is no. He would have been prone to ignore their needs by being selfish. But now he says, I will give half of what I own to help the poor people in my village. How did he get so rich? <clears throat> he did this by taking from others what rightfully belonged to them. Now he says, I will restore what I have taken by increasing it four times to make things right with them. What prompted this unusual confession to Jesus and his disciples? Well, look at verse 9 and 10. And Jesus said to him, Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. His soul had been resurrected from death to life. He was saved by this visit. And now he has a faith like Abraham of old. He has joined the ranks of the Samaritan woman and her village and the disciples. They all have life in their souls. The truth has changed all of their lives. And their lives can now be used to do what? Change others. I think this is designed by God. Change. To be an endless chain of good, which grows in influence and an impact toward others. I mean, the Apostle Paul explained it this way. It is God himself who has made us what we are and given us this, these new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Zacchaeus and the Samaritan woman were outcasts in their villages. Neither were looked upon with respect, but rather disdain. But Jesus used this woman to open the door to gaining a hearing among those in her village. John the Apostle wrote, Then they said to the woman, Now we believe because we have heard him ourselves, not just because of what you told us. He is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, who knows what the outcome of Zacchaeus' transformation will be in his own village. But I think it will have to be something similar to that Samaritan village. And this illustrates the story of the group of believers led to Jesus by Paul and his associates in Thessalonica. So what is the story behind the change experienced in Thessalonica. Well, let's look at it more closely. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5. having trouble finding it, it's just before second does <laughs> I couldn't help it. It was one of the thoughts that was trying by. I had to grab it. Okay, so first Thessalonians chapter one, verse five. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit 
and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So why was the effort to reach these people so successful? Well, it begins with the message delivered to them like Zacchaeus and the woman of Samaria. It wasn't the work of being clever with their use of words that accomplished so much. You see, these people living in Greece were familiar with the presentations of many, many speakers. Athens, in the southern part of the country, was described as follows. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. So what might have begun as a curiosity soon changed into something more than idle talk. And again, we keep coming back to, well, well, why? This was a message expressed with divine power behind it. With the Holy Spirit convicting the hearts of those who listened and with assurance that this was the right step to take in believing the truth. It was also evident that Paul and his associates had no interest in using whatever opportunity they had to profit from those listening to the message. Here's a description of Paul's visit to the southern part of the country shortly after his visit here. Dear brothers, even when I first came to you, I didn't use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. For I decided that I would speak only of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my preaching was very plain, not with a lot of oratory and human wisdom, but the Holy Spirit's power was in my words, proving to those who heard them that the message was from God. I do this because I wanted your faith to stand firmly upon God and not on man's great ideas. The truth is those listening to the message saw that it wasn't the creation of some man's great idea. It had to be from God. Because Paul didn't look like a used car salesman. He looked like a man in need of God's help. And God could be seen at work through him. This was far different from what they often saw from others making speeches in the land of Greece. How did these people react? Well, here's the report. Some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. So as we understand, some Jews were converted, and a much larger number of Gentiles, including the wives of important civic leaders. What was the outcome? of this change in the people living here? Well, there are three answers to this question, which we're gonna look at one at a time, beginning with, look at verse six. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Hey, there's our first answer. They became followers, or we would say imitators of these messengers and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what does this mean? They began practicing what they had received by taking it to others, as Jesus had instructed the apostles to do long ago when they were just known as disciples. And what did Jesus say? It's real simple. He said, freely you have received, freely give. That's it. How were these new believers treated by those who didn't respond to the faith? 
Well, look again at verse 6. It says, having received the word, notice, in much affliction. These new believers began to be treated like Jesus was in Israel by his opponents. And Jesus told the group of 12, the world would love you if you belong to it. But you don't. For I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave isn't greater than his master. So since they persecuted me, naturally, they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. The people of the world will persecute you because you belong to me. For they don't know God who sent me. You will be excommunicated from the synagogues and indeed, the time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing God a service. This is because they have never known the Father or me. I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember I warned you. So what did this look like in Thessalonica? Here's the report. The Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there's another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. You see, the Jewish believers would be excommunicated by the Jewish leaders of that synagogue. The Gentiles would be subjected to constant negative attention for refusing the pagan practices of family, friends, and business associates. And the rulers of the city would be unhappy with their wives and insist on them giving up this new way of life. That's what's happening in Thessalonica. Did all of this negative attention they received from others cause them to complain and pity themselves? Well, here's the second answer to our original question. Look again at verse 6. Notice what it says. With joy of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is the opposite reaction of what their persecutors expected. How could they remain positive under constant pressure to stop believing in Jesus? I think the answer is illustrated by the apostles and their sufferings. The council called in the apostles and had them be and then told them never again to speak in the name of Jesus and finally let them go they left the council chamber rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer dishonor for his name and every day in the temple and in their home Bible classes, they continue to teach and preach that Jesus is the Messiah. These people understood here in Thessalonica that living as Jesus would involve suffering for his name. It's no shame to suffer for that holy name. And when you suffer at an extreme level, it gets noticed by others, especially when your attitude remains the same as Jesus shown 
in this next example. What is the next example? Listen to this. When the council saw the boldness of Peter and John and could see that they were obviously uneducated, non-professionals, they were amazed and realized what being with Jesus had done for them. You see, the same was true about these believers living in this Greek city known as Thessalonica. How did their lives begin to change others? Here's our third answer. Look at verse 7. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Their plight and their faithfulness under such extreme pressure was being rewarded by influencing others in the faith in other locations all over Greece. Paul wrote of a similar experience that he had when he was in prison. And I want you to know this, dear brothers. Everything that has happened to me here has been a great boost in getting out the good news concerning Christ for everyone around here, including all the soldiers over at the barracks, knows that I am in chains simply because I am a Christian. And because of my imprisonment, many of the Christians here seem to have lost their fear of chains. Somehow, my perseverance has encouraged them, and they have become more and more bold in telling others about Christ. This plight of Paul described here that I just read came much later than this current experience of those in Thessalonica. They were doing what he would do and did do in his life. What can be said about this group of young believers at this stage of their development? I would say some understand what they are to do at a very early age in the faith. I didn't say it all. I said some. What a blessing it is to see this in these believers suffering for their faith in Jesus. It gives us a glimpse of what those in hostile locations all over the world do in spite of the persecution. Another side of their faith in action is the impact it has on those outside of the kingdom, living in other places. Look at verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every Place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. You see, unbelievers are talking about these folks in Thessalonica in many places, just like those that are in the faith are doing. You see, Thessalonica, that city, is a commercial center visited by salesmen, businessmen, tradesmen from all over the world. These people take the story of these believers with them to other locations because people enjoy talking about fascinating human interest stories. But these believers are also imitating the messengers of God which came to them. 
by sharing the truth with others in Greece. Paul, in a very short time, is hearing first-hand reports about their conversion from others. That's flooded the world scene. I was there. And he's being told what happened. And he's like, well, I was there. Yeah. Look at verse 9 and 10. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He says, I hear from others the entire story of your conversion and it all began with our visit to you. And it's the story of your faith in God and your rejection of those pagan idols that you previously worshipped. You no longer serve those dead things, but only the living God. You're busy serving God while you wait for the coming of His Son, who's very much alive. He has filled you with the hope of deliverance from the judgment of ever being condemned, just as He said. Well, what did Jesus say? I say emphatically that anyone who listens to my message and believes in God who has sent me has eternal life and will never be condemned for his sins, but has already passed out of death into life. Hallelujah. You know, I think it's obvious that their changed lives are being used to change others. Don't you? Huh? I think that's what's happening. By comparison, what's being observed and said about us? Is it anything like this? I mean, it can be if, if what? If we imitate Jesus and those who faithfully serve as his messengers. Remember, Paul said, imitate me, just as I also imitate Christ. Father in heaven, as we come before you right now, we are made aware of something very important. It's how this message of Jesus changes people. How by believing in him, we can be transformed into new people. And as new people, we can have influence and impact in our world. Just like, well, this group of young believers in Thessalonica, at the writing of this letter, they had only been in the faith weeks. 
maybe a month and a half. Not very long. And yet, we're amazed to see how quickly and how fast their lives were impacting others. Just young, young believers, just trying to imitate Jesus, just trying to imitate the messengers that were sent to them, just trying to serve the Lord, and looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ while they're doing it. Huh. I like to think, Father, that it's just simple things. It's not complicated. How we begin to have impact and develop in character. It's just as you've intended it. You've made it easy to do for anybody that will place their faith and trust in Christ and be obedient. My goodness, and, and what a change will happen and what an impact. That's what we seek today, Father. As a body of believers, we want to be known as a group that has impact and influence at our home, in our neighborhood, in our school, on the job, in the store, at the gas pump, in the hospital, in the nursing home, wherever we might be. It would be great to have that type of influence and impact. We commit ourselves to you, Father, in the name of Jesus. That's what would happen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The hymn we want to sing is number 436. Number 436. And we're going to be singing first and second verse. Number 436. So when you find your place, the boy man stand.
Dear Lord, we come to you to give thanks for the message that you have given to us today. We ask the Lord to help us to search our hearts and say, what would we give to Jesus? And we thank you for that message. And also, Lord, we thank you for Erica. We ask you to bless her, lift her up spiritually, and continue to use her from day to day. And we thank you for Erica's presence today. Fill her with your love, Lord, and we thank you. And also, Lord, I thank you for each brother and sister who came today to give you praise and glory and thanks for all that you do for us and all that you did for us at the cross. We ask you also, Lord, to bless Israel, lift her up, lift her up spiritually, Lord, touch their lives, and Lord, touch their hearts that today will be a day of salvation, that they will call upon your name and receive you into their life as your Lord and Savior. And we thank you, Lord. And bless America, lift America up spiritually, and bless it, and bless the people.